Hey team, welcome back. In this video, we're introducing springs. We will learn what they are and how they can both apply forces. So this is actually a video that could also help us use these for things like setting up Newton's second law and also the energy that springs can provide to objects. And of course, that's going to be important as we look at conservation of energy. It will allow us a new tool to have us find or conceptually think about the energies of objects, okay? So getting into a spring, I have a couple of diagrams right here. We'll get into some physics diagrams in just a second. Okay, a spring is usually some spiral made up of metal, and because of its shape, because of how it's made, it's able to stretch or compress. So I have a spring right here. I'm kind of going to hold it to my camera. Aha! Okay, you're all probably pretty familiar with springs. I bust open a, a retractable ballpoint pen, and you can find a little spring in there. This is sometimes called a compression spring, because this spring you can compress. I can squeeze the two things together, and when I do that, I obviously feel a force in the opposite direction. When I try and squeeze it together, I feel a repelling force oppositely. And likewise, if I take this same spring and if I try and pull it apart, I feel some resistance. It's almost kind of like a tension force. I feel some resistance. The spring wants to kind of go back to where it was. There is another type of spring. These are usually called extension springs. These are, frankly, usually easier to make, and they're often used for certain scenarios. But these ones, you can't actually compress them from their starting point. Don't, don't really worry too much about this jargon. We will assume in any physics problem that our springs for a particular scenario could either be compressed or stretched if necessary. But in either case, they are applying forces on my hands in this case, and they can apply forces on objects. So this diagram here, let's analyze the force that comes from a spring. So what I have here is I have a spring. This is my best attempt at actually being able to draw a spring by hand with my little computer mouse, okay? What I have here is a spring that's horizontal and it's attached to a wall. This red line right here, it's not meaning that it's tied to a wall on the right hand side. This spring is free, so to speak. Imagine it's kind of like this, I'm trying to hold it up. So on the left hand side, if you look at my screen, well it's attached to a wall and it's just staying nice and relaxed. You know, a spring all by itself when nobody is pushing in or pulling out, it has some relaxed kind of setup. It has a relaxed position. So here I have my spring nice and relaxed. Nothing is being pulled or stretched or compressed. So when we have that set up, how long this spring is, well that might be referred to as the relaxed length or how far out the end point of the spring is when it's not being stretched or compressed, it's referred to as this. This is the spring's equilibrium position. Meaning again, no force pushing inwards, no pu force pushing outwards. It's just relaxed. That is its equilibrium position, okay? The spring is just kind of hanging out, not doing anything. Well, let's imagine now I take that same spring, so it's tied to that wall, and now I start applying a force this way. So I apply a force. So again, you know, here's that spring. It's tied to the wall being played by my fingers. And I now pull the spring across. So now it's being a bit stretched here. So I apply a force. Now the spring is elongating a little bit. This little distance right here is referred to usually as delta x. It's a displacement, right? The spring was originally at this location, still being indicated right here. So if this right here, if this was like, say, I don't know, three centimeters, this is also three centimeters. But now this is some additional length that this spring is. It's some displacement of the spring, okay? I stretched it some amount. Maybe I stretched it an additional two centimeters, just making up numbers. So I can apply a force on a spring, I can make it stretch out, and it now is stretched a certain distance from its equilibrium position, okay? There's one more scenario I wanna provide. So let's imagine now kind of I stop pulling on the spring this way, I kinda of let it go back to its relaxed state, but now I'm gonna apply a force in the opposite direction. I'm gonna now try and compress, oh God, squeeze it inward. So now I'm gonna apply a force on my spring this way, like this. Well, now that spring is being compressed and, oh, look right here. Now there is some distance that it is away from its original equilibrium position. This is actually also called delta x. So this delta x term, simply put, okay, it's not meant to be confusing, it's just the displacement of the spring from this natural rest position or from this equilibrium position. So if it says in a problem that a spring is stretched one centimeter or it's compressed seven centimeters, that's just what it means. It's how much this spring is being changed from its original spot. Okay, of course this spring has some natural length, but delta x is kind of like the change. How much was it stretched 
or how much was it compressed, okay? So that's the first bit we gotta really understand because we're gonna see an equation for the force that acts from a spring onto an object, okay? Now the springs we are dealing with in this class, especially on you know, classic kind of practice problems, they're known as ideal springs. An ideal spring is one where we just don't have to worry about like its inertia, we don't have to worry about any imperfections or any ir irregularities about it. So an ideal spring, kind of funny, but we say it has no mass. Now of course in real life everything has mass, but again, so we don't have to worry about its own inertia, okay, anything like that. Uh, we're gonna say that, okay, let's not worry about any mass from these springs. Let's assume they act perfectly, there's no irregularities, anything that's getting in the way. A spring is considered ideal if it obeys something known as Hooke's Law. Again, technically this is strictly theoretical because all springs actually have mass. They all have some imperfections. But Hooke's Law is a simplified way to analyze problems that have springs in them. What it says is, this Hooke's Law, it's really an equation. It says that the force from the spring, the force that this spring can apply to my finger or apply to a block or any other object, the force from this spring is directly related, it is in fact directly proportional to, it is linearly related to how much it is displaced, how much that spring is stretched or compressed. It's an equation, this is what it is, so I'm gonna write it out. This is what Hooke's Law says. Hooke's Law, the force from a spring on an object, spring on object, it is equal to something known as lowercase k times delta x, okay? Now, lowercase k, that's known as the spring constant or sometimes called the spring stiffness. Spring stiffness. It's exactly what this second word sounds like. It's how strong, how stiff, how rigid this spring is. Some springs are, frankly, pretty, pretty weak. We'll see really weak springs. They don't take much force at all in order to bend or stretch or, uh, or compress them. But some springs, like the shocks that are in your cars, oh my gosh, they require huge amounts of force even to compress them just a little bit. So this is unique to each individual spring, how it's made, how big it is, etc. But this right here, we already saw this, this is the displacement. And reading this equation, it says that the more I stretch a spring, the more force there is from it. Or the more I compress a spring, the more force there is from it. Something else that we, we need to recognize is actually pretty important. Technically, this equation has a minus sign in it. And that means that, well, when you stretch a spring outward, the force is in the opposite direction. Remember, we're dealing with forces right now. We're not really talking about energy at the moment. Forces are vectors. So oftentimes, when you see this equation for Hooke's Law, you see it with this minus sign because the direction of the force is opposite how you're stretching or uh, compressing. If I take my spring and I push it inwards, my fingers are feeling a force outwards. And the opposite is true. If I stretch the spring, right, the spring wants to go back to its original spot. So if I'm stretching outwards, the force is inwards. So you'll often see a negative sign if you take additional classes in college. If you, you know, Google Hooke's Law online, you'll probably see equations that have this minus sign in it. Now, College Board, on the official AP Physics 1 uh, equation sheet, that's what I have right here, they give it with an absolute value sign. So this right here is the spring force. This is their version of Hooke's Law. There's that K, that spring constant, and they keep both of these things as absolute value signs. Again, sometimes you'll see it like this, but sometimes you'll see it with the negative sign. This doesn't mean the force of the spring is all we say to the left, right? It just is meant to indicate that the direction of the force and the displacement are opposites, okay? If you're drawing a free body diagram and the spring is exerting a force this way, well, you should call that a positive force. Don't make that negative just because there's a minus sign in this equation. But again, this is really here to tell you that when you're looking at the equation, these two things are always in opposite directions, okay? So that's why you might see that minus sign, but it doesn't change how we would approach our old Newton's second law kind of scenarios, okay? So that's Hooke's law. Plenty of springs in real life don't really follow this. We would say that that spring doesn't obey Hooke's law. It's a theoretical approach, okay? All right, so that's us looking at the forces that are coming from springs. Let's think about the work that springs can do. And I'm actually gonna move this diagram right here. Sorry, it was behind my floating head. 
we know that the work done by any force is equal to the force itself multiplied by the displacement. So just like I did for gravitational potential energy, we can look at the work done by this spring force, okay? The work done by this spring force is equal to, now I'm gonna pause, because what I'm gonna write right here is not as obvious, it's not as intuitive. And the reason why is the spring force is based on the displacement. And that actually means as you displace, as you stretch this spring more and more and more, the force is changing. In order to really understand what I'm about to write down, it requires calculus. You might actually recognize if you're in calculus, a integral being done. But I'm just gonna write down the results. It's not as obvious where this comes from. It turns out to be 1 half kx squared minus 1 half kx naught squared, okay? Again, it's not as obvious because technically you need calculus in order to figure it out, but that's our equation. And man, once again, we've seen this now a couple times. Here's a couple of interesting terms. This is given the label as the potential energy from a spring. Remember, U for potential energy and US for spring potential energy. The potential energy from a spring is equal to 1 half times K, how stiff the constant of that spring, times how much it is stretched or compressed raised to the second power. This is the new, or this is a new type of energy coming from a spring. When I have something compressed, it now has some additional potential energy because that spring could go boop, and it could all of a sudden start applying forces and displacements on that object. Now, I want to show you an animation that highlights both what I showed you before and also something about understanding whether this is a conservative or non-conservative force. Okay, so in this diagram, I might not be able to highlight my mouse if I bring my cursor over to it, but you see this mass on a spring going back and forth. Notice, similar to what I showed you on a couple slides ago, when the position, when the mass right now is compressing the forces in the opposite direction. Notice that red arrow and that blue arrow, they're always in opposite directions. That was why we have this equation with force that is, bam, in the opposite direction because what we see right here in this animation, when the spring is compressed, the force is outwards. When the spring is stretched, the force is inwards. They're always opposite, okay? Now let's think about the work that this spring can do. So right now I have an object, I have a little mass right here, and it's connected to a spring. Right now, let's say I'm displacing this mass this way. So the mass is moving to the right. Let me actually change the color. Let me get away from this yellow. Let's say I now have a displacement to the right. What direction is the force from the spring on my mass? The force from the spring is to the left. That means the work done by the spring is negative because they're in opposite directions. But then let's say, I don't know, maybe I let go of the block. So then all of a sudden, oh my gosh, now the spring is gonna be pushing on that block. And what's the displacement? It's to the left now. So now the work done by the spring is positive. Again, maybe here I'm pushing on the block, I'm compressing that spring. So the displacement of the block is right, but the force I know is in the opposite direction, it's to the left, aha. But then I let go. So now the spring is just able to freely push that block to the left, get it out of here, and its displacement is to the left. That means the work is positive. That means sometimes the work is negative, sometimes it's positive, that work can be undone. Oh my gosh, gang, the spring force is a conservative force, just like gravity. The spring force is conservative. This elastic potential energy, this force from springs is conservative, and that means when I did my little proof, it would fall into the conservative force category which means I can use it in conservation of energy. So that's the last little thing I'm showing. I know this is a slightly longer video than normal because we're talking about spring, something totally new in both forces and energy. But when I set up conservation of energy, I do E naught equals E. In the beginning, of course, I maybe have MGH naught. I have, say, maybe some kinetic energy, one half MV naught squared equals MGH plus one half MV squared. But let's look at this scenario. Here I'm dropping a rock. Let's say I drop the rock from rest, so V naught equals zero. It has some starting height. It falls, and then it lands, and oh my gosh, it's gonna land and compress a spring. Right here, V naught 
or V is zero. It's compressing this spring. But of course, if it's compressed this spring, oh my gosh, this spring wants to go pow and launch it upwards. And so then it launches this rock back up into the air. I can compare two points like I normally did. And because the spring force is a conservative force, I include this new 1 half kx squared as an energy term, 1 half kx squared. Oh. Now, luckily, oh my gosh, you don't have to write this whole thing out for most problems. Like if I was comparing this location here to this location, let's say I'm measuring my height from this spot here. So in the beginning, it doesn't have any kinetic energy. And there's no spring up here. The spring hasn't been compressed or anything yet. Right at the top here, it has no spring energy. It only has some MGH naught. But then when it's fallen and then it falls and compresses this spring downwards and then it stops moving for a moment, well, it doesn't have any height because I'm measuring height from right here, so that goes to zero. It's not moving for a second. It's compressing. It pauses. No kinetic energy. It has just 1 half k x squared. It has some spring energy. Now, you could maybe compare this location to this location, remember, and maybe there's a slightly different setup. But we can use conservation of energy like we have been just now. You have a third type of energy to keep track of. You might have to think now, OK, at this location, does it have potential energy from gravity? Yes or no. Does it have kinetic energy? Yes or no. Does it have potential energy from a spring? Yes or no. And that's really obvious. You know whether or not it has an object, an object has potential energy from a spring if it is compressing or stretching a spring. So if you don't see that happening, like right now, right here, it's not stretching or compressing anything, so no spring potential energy. Okay, so now it just really means the real result, the real conclusion is now there's a third type of energy an object might have based on whether it's touching and it's compa compacting, compressing, or stretching a spring. Okay, I know that was a little longer video than normal, okay, but that's it. We'll get lots of practice with springs in our class, both the force from springs and also the energy associated with them. All right, that's it. I'm out of here. Thanks for watching.